I'm Douglas Fraser. I work at the BBC as Business and Economy uh, Editor in Scotland. And uh, I have the happy position of welcoming you to the Parliament on behalf of the organisers of the Festival of uh, Politics for this discussion on future directions and options for uh, the economy. This year's festival, I'm told, is the 19th such uh, festival, provoking, inspiring, informing people uh, of all ages, from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, to engage in three days of uh, spirited debate. Uh, this is the third day, so if you've already been here, maybe you can uh, bring uh, opinions from other sessions that, that you've been at. And it's very telling for me, now living outside Edinburgh, coming back into the, the festival in, in August, uh, how much politics has become uh, it's the, the, the new stand-up comedy almost that uh, an awful lot of politicians have, have followed on from this festival of politics and are appearing in all sorts of other guises across across Edinburgh it's become oddly enough for the BBC uh, a key part of our news schedule now is following what politician is saying what and uh, in the last three days we've had three really important top lines from different politicians um, now uh, we're delighted that we've got guests here today and a good turnout as well. Thank you for coming here. I'm looking forward to hearing your views as well as the panel and indeed your questions, your contributions for this debate. Probably shouldn't have to be said, but it gets said these days anyway that this is a place for tolerance of other people's ideas and respectful listening to other people's ideas. I don't think we're going to have the kind of debate where that becomes too much of an issue, but who knows in the next 90 minutes. You can, if you want, share your views on social media, uh, at visit Scott Parle uh, on Instagram. I'd also like to remind everyone, and I have to say this for legal reasons, I think, that you are being live streamed on uh, and the Parliament's uh, Scottish Parliament TV channel uh, as well. Uh, today's uh, debate's held in partnership with uh, the Cross-Party Group on Social Enterprise and uh, the Scottish Parliament's Futures Forum, which is, uh, you may find uh, online that they've already been doing some work on some of the issues that we've been doing here. You can follow up by watching that again. Post-pandemic and in a cost-of-living crisis, uh, how can new ideas help us to build uh, a better economy. So I'm joined to uh, discuss all that by Emma Congreve and Jimmy Paul and Douglas uh, Westwater. Just to give you a brief introduction, you can say more about yourself uh, if you want to take that opportunity. But Emma's a, a senior knowledge exchange fellow, which I think means that you, you understand how to explain stuff to people. <laughs> um, and deputy director also at the Fraser Allender Institute at Strathclyde University. Uh, very helpful to us uh, in the media, uh, explaining things. And she has previously held roles as a senior economist at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and uh, as an economic advisor within the Scottish Government. Uh, Jimmy Paul is uh, director at the Wellbeing Economy Alliance Scotland, uh, which is to reprogram Scotland's economy so as it puts people and planet uh, first. Uh, Jimmy's worked in leadership roles across health and uh, social care for 10 years including a co-chair of the Independent Care Review. He tells me he's just about to leave the job he's currently in, but he's not able to tell us what he's about to start. <laughs> I think he knows, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're not to know just yet. Uh, and Douglas is a Chief Officer at Community Enterprise, a leading social uh, enterprise and community development consultancy, providing support as well. Um, Douglas has worked in Scotland's third sector for 25 years, and he's currently uh, the, uh, the chair of Social Enterprise uh, Scotland and on the cross-party uh, committee, uh, which is telling me John Swinney has just started uh, to chair. So there will be an opportunity for you to take part in uh, discussion, uh, but I think uh, as convention dictates, we're trying to be unconventional here, but not in the style of debate, I don't think. We're going to start the discussion uh, between ourselves here. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, uh, Emma, we, we've got all sorts of um, economic ideas. The cynic might say jargon. Uh, the well-being economy, inclusive growth, sustainable development, just transition, social enterprise, business purpose, mm. capital P, and a, a circular economy, a community w wealth building as well. Um, that's just some of them. What do you think are the threads running through these that are most important, most relevant, and most applicable to Scotland? Mm. Yeah, so it's, um, 
takes a lot of getting your head around when the, the next new um, phrase comes out to work out whether it's different or the same from what's come before sometimes. But they all point to the need uh, for the economy to work in a way that kind of meets a range of different needs. And they change over time. Obviously, um, different needs come to the fore, different evidence uh, becomes available, um, and different kind of um, preferences amongst uh, politicians and, and society come forward. That, and that really needs, should and does shape the economic debate. Having, you know, I suppose that feeling that, the, that it needs to be more than just economic growth you know, growth for what sake, you know, is very much at the heart of a lot of those. And it's not a new idea in economics, you know, the need for um, some kind of shaping of what the economy does, um, sort of containing it and ensuring that it works for more than just those, you know, who are at the top, top of the capitalist tree, I suppose, you know, it's an idea that goes back pretty much to Adam Smith, you know, it's not I think it's most discussed about Adam Smith, but he was very clear that um, the economy, you know, the market can't just be left to itself. You know, it does need um, these kind of guardrails around it. And arguably, that's how a lot of how government came into being in order to provide those, um, yeah, function for ensuring that where the market fails, the government is able to step in and shape things in a way that works for for, for the many, not the few, uh, to use a phrase that's used at the moment. Although, you know, questions remain on the right balance, the right sort of interventions, and there's, there's never necessarily going to be a right answer on that. There are just going to be different competing elements that need to, you know, to be kind of brought together and a consensus taken forward. Um, so, yeah, all of these kind of terms reflect that changing dynamic, I think, in the, um, in the economy and in and the people who shape the economy. I think where we sort of run into issues is where you just get a lot of confusion and, you know, a lot of um, unsh people, particularly businesses, being unsure. And that's what we hear a lot of what is expected of them. You know, the next new thing coming along, um, you know, a, a lot of um, people want certainty about where they go um, and what they invest in. Um, what choices they make, you know, even people thinking about um, what careers they move into, you know, there, there are so many things um, that people want to know um, about um, what the government's preferences are going to be and what the economy is going to look like in the future. Um, but that sense of the needing to be a balance between competing forces, as I say, is, um, has been a feature of the market and of economics. Yeah, um, since the word um, economists were, were was kind of invented and I think we're still yeah just seeing seeing that now it's interesting you say it's about the parameters around the market the market remains the dominant strand through this in a way that some radicals in the past have wanted to replace it completely yeah absolutely it's I mean it one of the things I find quite difficult at the moment is that we do seem to be forced into these kind of polarized positions of you know growth versus um, everything else, you know, and I don't think that is the way the way forward. I, I think saying that that the economy and the market is not a key part of improvement of living standards and is not a key solution to working through some of the issues we've we've got and we need to address, such as you know climate change, poverty, inequality. I think is losing sight of of you know the good bits of the economy and. You know, and the economy includes like the public sector, includes teachers, includes social workers, you know, they're they are contributing to our GDP as well. So, you know, it's it's it has to be a, a much more nuanced kind of understanding of how of what the economy is, how it works and how it can be made to sort of function in a way that um, meets societal preferences. But, yeah, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> Jimmy, over to you. What, what uh, to return to the long list of of uh, uh, economic ideas, themes, and possibly jargon. What what do you pick out as the, the most important strands for you? Well, good morning, everyone. First of all, the most relatable thing you were saying there, Emma, is about security and knowing what jobs you're going into. And I'm really sorry. I I do have a new job. I just can't <laughs> share what that is right now. And I know that's very mysterious. Um, 
Uh, that was a really helpful summary, Emma. And you know, the wellbeing economy, I'll give a definition of it shortly, but the purpose behind it was to be a picnic blanket for all of these different ideas, donut economics and circular economy, uh, maybe less inclusive growth because of its dependence on GDP as, uh, as a kind of sole measure, or not a sole measure, but a key factor. And actually, we just do need to be much more nuanced, as you say, and critical and understanding of the limitations of GDP. Just walking up here, I was seeing all on the screens, you know, the wildfires in Hawaii at the moment, uh, the droughts, the floods that we're seeing, climate breakdown, and actually, uh, can we continue to extract at the rate which we are? Um, I just don't think we can. I just don't think that's synonymous with an economy that we need. So a well-being economy is in a sentence about social justice on a healthy planet. The one thing I might challenge Emma on is some of that underlying frame of contributing to GDP, contributing to the economy. Well, the wellbeing economy movement suggests that we should flip that and the economy should serve us rather than us kind of maybe working longer hours or being more efficient in workplaces. Actually, we need to flip that a little bit. And to define that further for you all, our co-founder, Catherine Trebek, and lots of her colleagues through their research, through their time spent with communities all over the world, came up with five wheel needs, as we call them. Uh, dignity, nature, purpose, fairness, and participation. All things that we should have in order to live good lives. And I doubt that anyone in this room or watching will disagree with those things as something we should pursue. But actually, the, the challenge comes in the how we get to that point. And in order to make that feel clearer for you guys and for us as an organisation trying to be that picnic blanket, we talk about the four P's. Now, if you've got the thousand pieces of Scotland, you've got business, you've got the markets, you've got the public sector, you've got people with lived experience of a range of things and many more groups that you need to play their part in order to build this economy. It feels like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And to make that feel better, we talk about the four P's or the four corners where we start. The first is purpose. So what's the express purpose of our economy? Is it to grow at any and all cost to people and planet or actually is it to serve us? And we know and we can talk about the limitations of GDP all day, but the fact that wildfires and drought and these things require trades of goods and services that are positive for GDP growth, but unpaid care work isn't a factor in that. It's just one example of many that we could share on why the purpose of our economy needs to shift. Prevention. So how do we, to use that famous metaphor, stop just pulling people out of the river further downstream and go upstream and understand why they're falling into it? And how can we design our economy to deliver prevention? Pre-distribution, so putting a P in front of redistribution. So instead of, again, thinking further downstream how we might, through taxation, fix issues that we've come up against, how can we design and program our economy to get things right first time round? And you might think about initiatives like community wealth building or progressive taxation as a way to achieve that. And the last P, if I had to choose, it's my favourite, would be participation. How are we meaningfully involving people, society, communities in the shaping of our economy? Now, I'm not an economist, which is why it's so nice to share a stage with people that have a deep knowledge of the economy, and you'll hear from them in, in greater detail on that soon. I also have lived experience of the care system. I grew up in harsh poverty. And to be in a space like this and on a panel like this, discussing the economy, I think we need more people with different lived experience and diverse perspectives shaping the economy so the conversation's not just about markets and business. Jimmy, thanks very much. There's a lot to return to there, and as I said earlier, you can be asking your questions before too long as well, but I'm, I'm going to turn to Douglas now. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of churn around these ideas at the moment. I'm wondering if this is a particularly um, appropriate time for so many things to be bubbling up in discussion in the Scottish Parliament and, and beyond. That this, this discussion is a, very much a creature of the time it's in. Uh, quite some time after the financial crash caused such a, a crisis in faith in, in the way the market works, but also COVID is shaken us up so much, indeed Brexit has as well, but, but COVID to a more fundamental level about people's values and their relationship with their work, for instance. So how much is this a, a creature of the, the moment that we're in at the moment? Well, I, I mean, I certainly think it's been, it's been pushed forward by those things, but that, that con these concepts of 
I mean, there's a, someone said to me recently, the Scottish Government is, is brilliant at strategy, um, and, and best in the world at strategy and ideas, and probably not so great at making them happen. So I think when bad things happen, like cost of living and um, COVID and so on, politicians, of course, think, well, what are we going to do about this? We need to change things. So you get a tsunami of ideas. Um, I, so all of these things have come up. And I think probably from a social enterprise perspective, um, and I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you all the flaws of it, but um, I'm sure some people can ask some pertinent questions. So since I'm chair of Social Enterprise Scotland, I'll tell you how amazing it is. Um, but I, over that time, I think as these things have come out, um, community wealth building, right, we need to invest locally. I think the social enterprise sector, along with many other sectors, but certainly the social enterprise sector, we're going, well, yeah, obviously, we've been doing that for years. Um, and then they would talk about, well, the just transition to, yeah, yeah, I've been doing that for decades. Um, and then they say, aha, we need a place-based economy with 20-minute neighbourhoods. And mm, yeah, I've been doing that for a long time. So I think there's a feeling that social enterprise has been a model of the economy um, and a, a model for delivering trading and delivering enterprise has almost become into its own now because of all this stuff. So it's, it's pushed that forward where there's a meeting of strategy. And then I think there is, social enterprise isn't by, by any means the only solution, but there's a... There's a model there that can say, well, yeah, look, we can achieve all of that. And so there's, there's something around delivery now that we need to be pushing forward as a, as a nation. So uh, social enterprise is the sort of basket in which you can put all of these things. I'm hearing also that the, the well-being economy is the basket in which you put all of these things. I mean, this, this may be a semantic point about, about uh, definitions of, of these uh, different terms that we're using, but why social enterprise in particular? Well, I think social enterprise potentially is a model to achieve the well-being economy. It's a tool in the box. Um, and potentially there are lots of tools. But I suppose if in, when cutting to the chase, uh, I, the, the census was out which um, the sector were involved in. So social enterprise sector is worth around about 4.8 billion in turnover, approximately. Um, and I was challenged yesterday about finding some statistics. So I googled um, how big the Scottish economy was. And uh, Emma will probably correct me. And this is probably wrong since it was Google on the train this morning. Um, but a turnover of the Scottish economy of about 170 billion. Add another 10 billion on if you want to include oil. So I suppose social enterprise, if you look at the potential impact, the model of social enterprise is how you generate money and then what you do with it. It's not about being shy about generating money. I tell people to generate as much money as you possibly can. It's about how you generate it and then what you do with it. So with 4.8 billion, you can do quite a lot of reinvesting back in, 100% of profit reinvested back, in, back into communities and back into organisations. And I suppose we just have to visualise imagining 170 billion reinvested back into a nation just imagine what difference that could pretend. I mean, you would transform the economy forever. Um, and that's really the model of social enterprise is about reinvesting that. And, and, and there's potentially a vision to do really quite radical things with, with that. The, the, Jimmy, the, the word enterprise became very much part of politics uh, in the Thatcher years. Uh, she didn't, <coughs> didn't always attach the word social to it, of course. Um, are you, how comfortable are you with, with enterprise? Because it, it hints of sort of entrepreneurialism a, 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 as well. What place does that have in what you'd see as the, the wellbeing economy? It's got a really central place. We're big fans of what you do and everything you've described there. And as long as purpose is at the heart of what we're doing, and as long as we're thinking about reinvestment and pro-social business models and ways in which wealth is shared more equally and, you know, other things like what is the CEO's wage as opposed to the least paid person in that business and the fact that the ethos of what your work stands for and social enterprises and other pro-social work asks those questions and it considers power, how is power shared between staff and executives and also um, it's it acknowledges the role of the planet and the fact that we cannot... We, a couple of weeks ago, we reached Earth Overshoot Day, didn't we, for Scotland, uh, for the UK. Uh, it, it acknowledges those questions as well. So providing you're considering these things, it's absolutely a key, key feature of a wellbeing economy. Emma, pick up on these themes if you want. Uh, you, I think you're being credited with being the economist on, on, <laughs> on this so. panel. <laughs> Uh, and, and therefore trained to believe in gross domestic product uh, as the god up there. Now, it has been critiqued very extensively. Um, remind us what you think the, 
the problems are with it, but also the strengths, the reasons why we might want to hang on to it. Yeah, so I would, I would challenge that that's, that's part of the economic orthodoxy. I think it's part of some um, parts, you know, the, um, of what is assumed that economists believe in. But the way I was taught economics and the way I now teach it at Strathclyde is, is much, you know, it's not how we are, are taught to think about these things. A whole point of being an economist is you're able to take in a range of factors and be able to kind of come up with a, a, a solution or a way forward that is able to take, um, take on many different um, costs and benefits. You know, particularly government economists, that's what we were trained to do. So the, the kind of the economic growth, the, the, the billions that may be produced by um, a certain investment in terms of, um, you know, in, in, in the economy, would be balanced against us trying to be able to cost up the potential negative impacts in, on the environment or would be uh, looked at in terms of, okay, so but what would that mean for, you know, you build a new uh, train line, yes, you'll get economic benefits out of that in terms of, um, of businesses, but you'll also be reducing commuting times for people and that's a core benefit that you cost and put into the model alongside. Um, those other factors that, that you might assume economists <laughs> are, are more um, concerned about. So I, I think there is this misconce uh, misconception that that is, that is all we care about, but it's not how we are trained to think about the world. Um, I think what you find is that there are, the economy is made up of people, you know, and businesses are groups of people that have a particular um, interest and when you talk to, uh, you know, a lot of businesses we talk to are totally on the same page in terms of they want a business that, um, that obviously is able to continue to, to trade, but that looks after its workers because obviously they need their workers in order to, to do that. They don't want to be, you know, producing harmful externalities, but there is... Externalities. Like, oh, sorry. Stop you there. <laughs> Extern <laughs> harmful things that happen as a result of, of you know, pollution being a key one. Um, but, you know, within the economy, because it's people, we also have power dynamics. We have politicians with a lot of power. We have some businesses and business leaders with a lot of power. But I'll come back to your question in a second. <laughs> um, so we just have to, you know, realise it's people making decisions for various reasons. And mo most of them want to, to do well by their, you know, fellow human being their employee but they also have to you know be able to pay the bills and you know there's all these competing factors that, that come into 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 your mind when you are just trying to operate um, and produce a service or a good which you know you may want to challenge whether that should be the heart of of um of, of what people get up every day to do um but yeah i think that pragmatically that's the situation um that we're in and we, we just need to be really careful not to assume that some people just because they're in a business that's a for-profit business that they are you know that's harmful in some way and, and I'm oversimplifying here. So if you're running a, a business you're not getting up in the morning to say I must improve Scotland's GDP that's not that's not not your top priority you're trying to make payroll at the end of the month yeah, uh, is, is where their focus is and particularly through a series of quite extraordinary crises that, that, that we've had in the past uh, yeah. few few years affecting different sectors in different ways. Now the Fraser of Allender Institute in, in Strathclyde does a lot of surveying of business uh, opinion. Um, how much has, has business changed its outlook, particularly I guess since uh, the, the crisis of 2008, the financial crisis hitting, hitting the, the, the banks uh, in particular, but lots of sectors in different ways towards what's known as, as ESG, sort of environment, social and governance, uh, is yet more jargon, mm. uh, which you are more likely to hear within, within business than necessarily within this dis discussion. But they're trying to feel their way towards a much more nuanced set of targets for business or a more nuanced means of getting to a target of a successful business. T tell, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so People in businesses, as I've said, are just, are just like you and I. They, they are getting up in the morning, trying to you know, deal with what comes across their plate, um, but also absorbing all of the news, all of the new ideas that, that are coming out, um, realising that they too, yes, need to, to play their part in it. 
obviously when you've got large companies at big juggernauts you've got lots of people with competing ideas potentially um, and it does take time to turn those juggernauts around but certainly we have seen this kind of um, this this kind of um, move around um, to seeing some of these issues as things that are you know need to be addressed by businesses and potentially there is some commercial benefit in in that, in that for them but I think much more of a realization, I think particularly around issues around climate, that people do need to, in businesses, do need to play a role here. I how, how much is that self-interest that they're being influenced by, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's a real risk that their business model could be undermined or that their investors are going to pull money if they're not committed to uh, environmental targets or that their customers are going to turn uh, against them. And how, how do these balance out? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, the, the, one of the good things about the market is that you can't stand still. You have to react to these these um, diff, different preferences from people, these different interventions from government. You, you have to mould yourself around them. So there will be that kind of, we have to do this because, you know, otherwise we won't survive. But there will also be, you know, people with different ideas about what's the best thing to do, you know, just from their own kind of backgrounds or their own preferences. So you've got all of that coming together. And I think that is one of the things about the economy that we've seen. I mean, I shouldn't use the word economy because I, I think it's just a meaning. Well, <laughs> it's term in a lot of ways. If you can't use it here, where can you? <laughs> but what do we actually mean by the economy? I think that's, uh, you know, if we're talking about, say, um, profits, seeking businesses, say, you know, um, or businesses that want to survive uh, financially, you know, so, um, so yeah, no, they are, um, they're feeling that they, they do need to, to make these changes in order to, to survive. And we've seen so much flexibility over the past, you know, since the financial crisis, you know, which was the first major shock we'd seen in, you know, in decades. And, and since then, the amount of different things that, that businesses have had to adapt to, some have gone by the wayside, but we still, I mean, to, the fact we still have businesses open after the pandemic, you know, it's, and, and, and are, are, you know, many are thriving, some are still struggling, but that adaptiveness um, in real time because of people on the ground having to make changes um, and are, are able to do that, it can be a much more dynamic and a faster way than a government trying to shape you know, obviously, um, there are different models of how an economy is developed, but a, a very centrally controlled um, economy um, doesn't move, uh, isn't very dynamic. <laughs> and, and, you know, politicians maybe aren't the best ones to know what the best thing to do on the ground is. So, Yeah, I'm always very struck in, in having covered politics here and then covering business that a politician faced with a problem um, identifies the problem and, and worries at it and tries to find a solution to it. Very clear with business that they're clear sighted about seeing the opportunity that comes out of it. Uh, and it may be overwhelming, the, the, the set of problems, but nevertheless, there are opportunities come out of it. And mm. recessions lead to all sorts of very successful companies emerging from the circumstances that we're in. Just one quick thing. Yeah. It is about aligning. Uh, this is a jargony term, aligning incentives. So, but just being oh able to say you know get everyone on the same page and they know where they're going and that comes back to certainty as well businesses will adapt and um will will see those opportunities and will go for them if they if they're clear on what on what the route ahead is i think we see this with the the green agenda there's chopping and changing sometimes of actually what the next 10 20 years is going to be it makes it very difficult to actually get those um, incentives aligned and on the same page and moving in the same direction. So we'll come on to that in terms of the policy uh, a bit later. But Douglas, to pick up on that, you, you, you were talking earlier about the extent to which the, the social enterprise sector is uh, a relatively small percentage, significant size, but a relatively small percentage. How much do you see the, the majority of the economy, which is the private sector economy, um, looking to what you're doing in social enterprise for some lessons, uh, particularly around these environment, social governance issues? Mm, okay. Um, I think, as I say, there is a danger that the three of us will just agree. Um, so I'll try my best to say something that's maybe not quite an agreement. Um, but if we're looking in to change... In a respectful and tolerant way. In a respectful and tolerant <laughs> way, of course, absolutely, because I'll, I'll probably have be having a cup of coffee with these people in an hour <laughs> or so. Um, but no, genuinely, I think if we want to change the economy, that will not be done by the private sector. That will not happen. 
I mean, I think what the stuff that Em's talking about is absolutely correct. Of course it is. And I think there's a huge strategic move in the Scottish government to um, encourage, force, nudge the private sector towards being lovely and nice. So, um, you know, you might get community benefit clauses in tendering. They might be encouraged to do, take on apprenticeships. There might be um, net zero requirements and, and so on. And of course, some businesses are run by humans and they want to look after their staff and some are lovely and some are less lovely. But fundamentally, they are legally obliged to make money. That is their purpose. They are absolutely legally, culturally and institutionally there to make money. That is their core purpose. Now, along the way, they might do good stuff and they employ people who pay taxes and that pays for social care. And, you know, but they, that's their role, is to make money. Whereas if you have something that, if you're trying to move the economy, it has to move towards an institutional way that the core purpose is to make the difference that, um, that, that Jimmy's talking about. So if you're, if, and it's not just social enterprise, but if social enterprise is a model as, as cannot make money, it can only make a difference to the community. That's its, its purpose is to make a difference to the world. So there is a, there's an issue there around where that investment goes and the, the, to the extent to which that the private sector can actually make a difference. It can be nudged, but it will never change the world. I wonder if anybody in, in the audience uh, wants to respond to that, because I'm imagining that some people will be employed within the private sector or may run their own companies and, and may have views on whether that's a fair assessment of what the private sector does. There's a hand up there. Uh, hi, my name is Eleonora and... Uh, Sorry, uh, the microphones, this because you, you are being streamed, remember, so other people will want to hear what you're saying. My name is Eleonora and I work uh, for the Scottish Council for Development and Industry and actually I have hosted an event uh, with uh, Douglas uh, back in May. Um, uh, I think uh, that is an interesting point uh, what he's saying but at the same time uh, I've been talking to many social enterprises and at the moment they are saying that uh, it's not a shame to make money because obviously they have to sustain what they do and uh, they have to look after the staff, they have to make sure that they pay their bill. And at the same time, especially as a Scottish Council for Development and Industry, we released a report about business purpose and about the fact that, that yes, there are private businesses that are making money, but at the same time, they are looking after the problem of the people and the planet. So I think in this particular moment, we have a great opportunity that is for the private sector and the third sector or social enterprise to learn to each other because they are both strong in what they are doing. And I think more and more private businesses have uh, uh, the goal of uh, making a profit but doing something else. That's the reason why they are purposeful. So it's a quite interesting take from uh, Douglas about the private and uh, sector and the third sector. But I think uh, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think uh, more and more businesses understand that they have to step up and make the difference because many times it's easier for businesses to be more reactive than government and policies. And I think especially in Scotland for what I can see, uh, uh, there is this, uh, there is this uh, interest, uh, and we are already moving. I hope towards the right direction. Okay. Any other points that pe people would wish to raise? Yes, down here again. Wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Douglas. Esther Roberton, and fess up, I'm here as part of the Parliament's Futures Forum, so I have a particular interest. But I've also been interested in this subject for a very long time, going back to when Catherine Trebek developed the Humankind in um, Index um, as an alternative to GTP. And obviously, we now have Carnegie, uh, the research organisation, developing their own measure. And in fact, was involved in SCDI when they dropped the social bit from their purpose because they were supposedly about the social and economic development of Scotland, and then they became about the economy, and interestingly have gone back to social, because it is about what's the economy for. The other issue for me is we've just had 300 years of, of the Adam Smith tercentenary, and as a Pfeiffer, um, I was part of some of the celebrations there. I grew up in the 80s thinking that the Adam Smith Institute were right in claiming that he was a free marketeer. And of course, I brought two quotes. One professor said, Adam Smith didn't believe in greed. And the other was, no society can surely be flourishing and happy, of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. And I think it comes back to Jimmy's point about the well-being economy and what it's for. And I do think this is a moment 
because I think the transparency issue, the inequality, the crisis of, of COVID and then the cost of living crisis has brought people's attention and people are thinking very differently. And I do think it's time to grab that opportunity. And I think my, my regular one was your point about the salary multiplier. You know, when I was growing up, chief execs earn 20 or 30 times their employees. If you go to local government or the health service, that's still true. But you go to some of the big private corporations and it's many hundred times. And people now know that and they know that's not acceptable. So I could rant for hours, but I won't. Um, I was at the land reform debate last night in virtual sense. And the claim there was for a more radical approach. And Finlay, the MSP who was chairing, then listed all the bills going through Parliament that are linked to land reform. And as someone who helped design this place, I was staggered that it was so fragmented. <coughs> so my question to you as a panel is, what do you think both the Parliament and the government can do? Because our role is to help the MSPs think longer term about the big difficult issues. And our big project this year is about inequality. So what would your advice to the Parliament and government be about how to address these economic issues? Can, can I hold on? That's a very, very good question. It's one I think we'll, we'll lead on to once we've explored some of the issues, if you don't mind. But I, I just, there's no other points uh, anybody wishes to make at the moment about the, that Douglas's provocation there about the role of the private sector being so focused on making money. Um, I'll turn it to Emma. You, you do the do the math, as it were, the crunching the, the, the surveys, uh, Fraser of Allender. Um, how do you respond to that, that ferocious provocation you've just yeah. had from the left? <laughs> I mean, not just from the kind of work we do with surveys, but from the work we actually do with businesses. And going back to your point, I don't think a lot of um, business owners would necessarily agree that that's their, that's their you know, making money is, is their focus, surviving and being able to continue doing what they are doing is a focus and that has a financial element to it. But in terms of what drives people in business, you know, it's, it's similar to what drives you and me in terms of, of, of what we do with our lives. There are many competing factors there. There are many things going on. And we, I think we just have to be really careful about oversimplifying, you know, business bad because they make money versus, you know, social work is good, you know, it's, um, it, it's much more complicated than that. And I do fear that we get too polarised. And um, when terms like the wellbeing economy, I'm being a bit provocative here, <laughs> do make businesses feel that they're backed into a corner and being told that they are, they're the problem. Um, when actually, for, for many, and there will be some that are never, you know, they're never going to change and are going to disrupt and Greed will be part of their, their DNA as well. But for many, the solutions lie with them as well. Um, so, yeah, to, uh, it will be good to get away from, yeah, this polarisation. Jimmy, there's the provocation for you. Um, it, are, are, do you feel what you're campaigning for is backing business into, into a corner? I mean, I've said earlier, we are pro-business that are social, that consider people profit and planet. And I can understand why some businesses do feel backed into a corner or threatens, too strong a word, annoyed, because we are quite vocal when we see an injustice, we'll name it. You know, you spoke about the fragmented landscape um, accurately. And we've got the Business Purpose Commission, which I think is going to do fabulous things if it is supported with incentives and money and investment. But we also have the Business Advisory Group to the Scottish Government and senior ministers there, of which BP has been a member. You know, how is that, how is that the right thing to do? And, you know, Emma, I agree with you, there are many businesses, small businesses, of course, the stats show this, that are surviving and have the right intention and exist to serve people with the right motives and intentions, it, it's fabulous, and they should be supported too. But there are also those where greed is an essential, central factor in their model, and we need to call out when that happens. You're saying BP should not be part of an advisory panel? On, absolutely, on, on deciding what a wellbeing economy is, the future of the economy, and deciding how we get to an economy that serves people and planet. I really think we need to think carefully about where people are at on a journey, if they're on that journey at all, in understanding their contribution to greed, their contribution to the destruction of the planet. Do you not need to get a company like BP into the room 
to convince them. Because I mean, they, they would come back and say, well, we have a lot of targets on, on environment, social and governance and investing heavily in the transition. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's just or not, it's a big transition to renewable uh, energy and you need the deep pockets of a company like, like BP. It, indeed, I was struck uh, in, uh, at the, the, the COP26 summit in Glasgow, the extent to which we went into it having an argument over a uh, hundred billion dollars of support for poorer countries from richer ones at a government level, we came out of it with a realisation that that was a drop in the ocean compared with what's required for this transition and you need the private sector, including companies like BP, to be spending trillions and that the financial sector is absolutely vital to this. Trillions upon trillions of dollars, are going to, pounds, are going to have to be put into that uh, just transition. So you do need these uh, companies with, with their, their track records uh, and uh, their controversies. You do need them coming into the room, don't you? Well, I mean, you can have them in the room, but I don't think they should be making decisions on things where there is a, a real contravention in their principles and what they stand for. And I could be on board with them being in advisory spaces if it wasn't linked to the massive increase in shareholders' payout in the last year or two since the increase in uh, cost of living crisis and energy bills since February 2022. So... I just think we need to critically analyse and be aware of the intention of these organisations and uh, you know, be open to understanding that they might be on this journey, but I just don't think in that example BPR. Do you think, I mean, part of it, part of it is, is, and Douglas was referring to, to this implicitly at least, that they, they have a legal responsibility. Their first fiduciary duty is to their shareholders, and that is deemed often to be... Um, dividends, it's financial, uh, and their shareholders are not seen as people who get a benefit from environmental work and so on. It, it comes down to a bottom line and it kind of simplifies things. If you're uh, uh, on, the, on the board of directors of, a, of a, a publicly quoted company, you know what, what your target is. Does that need to be changed and probably at a legal, legislated level so that the role of the board of directors is more nuanced and perhaps rather more complex, puzzling and conflicted? I think you've asked a question you know the answer to and you know what I'll say and you know what the, <laughs> the whole audience will agree with. I think that is an absolutely brilliant, accurate assessment. I just don't think we can continue as we are with greed at the centre and I don't extend that to all businesses at all. Douglas, can I bring the roots since I've got the microphone? <laughs> yes. I realised the point I was going to make, which is an example of that. I did a seminar over lockdown on a global um, governance debate that taught me something I didn't know, because I've worked in the private sector, but I've not been on a private sector board. The seven responsibilities of a company director actually aren't just about the shareholder dividend. It's about the long-term sustainability of the company, and they're required to give due regard to community, to stakeholders, to staff, and to the environment. So actually, the Companies Act already says that. The difficulty we've got is too many directors think their job is maximise shareholder return, and it actually isn't. But it's about how do we hold companies to account. I'll give the microphone back now so I don't go. Uh, <laughs> Emma, can I pick up on, on one thing that you were referring to uh, earlier, that one of the influences on the way that businesses operate, um, apart from shareholders and the need to, to deliver on all of these already quite complex set of targets, they have to recruit and retain staff and motivate staff. Um, there's some evidence, isn't there, that Generation Z, Z is coming through and making demands uh, from lower level of, uh, of the, the hierarchy of businesses to say, if you want to recruit us, if you want to retain us, and if you want to motivate us, uh, you are going to have to operate differently. That actually staff are driving change within organisations in a way I don't think we've ever seen before. Yeah, so there are a few good things that have come out of the last five, six years, but the fact that the labour market is so tight at the moment, and as you say, there's a new, new generation with, with different ideas coming through, means that there is more of a need for businesses to, to um, work out what's best for their uh, workforce in order to keep to retain and to recruit um, i think that's one of the things that 
where I kind of sit on a more sort of um, more pragmatist side, that actually that's an opportunity that you that we should be looking at. Okay, so how can we help businesses to understand what kinds of things they could do in order to kind of meet those needs? We've been done, doing some really interesting work with hospitality businesses and trying to bring them together to do some peer learning from each other to try and work out how to solve some of the issues that, 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 are, that are having an impact on retention recruitment. Um, for example, how best to support their staff who they know are having issues with their health, be it physical or mental health, and how best to support them, um, be it issues around um, you know, being able to help people uh, with who are on quite seasonal work, balance their kind of uh, money over the year to make these places attractive and not and to make some of those downsides less um, sort of unappealing to, to their workforce. And the hospitality is one of the areas with some of the biggest recruitment challenges at the moment. So of course, yeah, the workforce does have more power now. And, and I think we that is one of those opportunities. But businesses, um, you know, often, especially the smaller ones, operating, you know, quite, um, they, they don't always have the chance to come together and get this advice and actually take a step back and, you know, they, they need to pay the bills, you know, they're, they're on the phone to the bank for, for hours at a time, <laughs> you know, to give them that space to take that step back and, and, and understand these different ideas. We found the opportunity we gave them with this peer learning enabled them to do that, take that step back out of their day job. But the list of things they, they're dealing with at the moment is so big. Um, but I think there is that opportunity to say, OK, if you want to do something a bit differently, you know, here are some of the, those ideas. And it's not just about paying the living wage, which I think is really important and all businesses should be aspiring to. But some businesses at margins, they can't just switch to that immediately. They need those kind of other things um, that kind of lead them on the path towards that, perhaps, but are things that they feel they can implement in the here and now and to move them yeah, further forward. Um, businesses are more reactive than government. I think I've heard that from the audience as well, but they still, you know, they still have to go, things still have to work for them and they still have to be um, sure of its success as they move along in incremental steps sometimes in order to get to a final destination. Jimmy, if, if uh, we've, we've heard about, you know, this is uh, academics who are going into business, sometimes they've got all sorts of pressures and not much time. Uh, you said you keep BP out of the room uh, of, of advisors, but what if BP asks you in and says, we, we need to understand better what you want of us? Now, you don't have to go with BP because it's all sorts of complexities about a specific company. But in general, a company that doesn't feel it's doing enough in terms of addressing the well-being issues you've got, what do you do when you go into the room to advise them? What, what, what's your message to them? We have I've been in post for two and a half years and we've got a long line of organisations who have done exactly that. They've come to us and said, we like this idea, we understand the principles, how do we play our part? So we've had the Scottish Football Association write a report with us on the role of football in a wellbeing economy. Really fabulous report. We've worked closely with a big funder in Foundation Scotland who said, look, we feel that we're investing once harm has happened in a really downstream reactive way how can we fund in a way that is more upstream and preventative and in line with the well-being economy we've done this we wrote a report actually on business and the well-being economy with scottish enterprise so we have a long line and that's a few examples a long line of organizations coming to us and asking that and i think that's a showing of serious intent you know how can we work together to better understand this and our door is open for those types of conversations well I have to ask you in that case, let's take as an example football, which isn't always seen as a, as a conventional enterprise. Uh, it's uh, perhaps one of the earliest social enterprises was setting up football clubs. What, what came out of that project when they asked you what you could be doing together? Lots of things. The first is understanding the role of physical exercise in, in well-being, in building a sense of community and the impact of that on the lifelong health of those people. It's not just when children are playing and starting to play football but it's also things like walking football for older people and the sense of community that brings in a time when coming out of <laughs> covid and with an aging population that loneliness is a real challenge that we're facing so those are a few things it's about community connection the physical health benefits and that's contribution to uh, prevention and any other examples of companies where perhaps more conventional companies you've, you've gone in and 
changed their behaviour and their perceptions? Yeah, there were lots, lots and lots. We've got a project, my favourite is working with a local authority, so uh, Perth and Kinross Council, um, a council that has uh, got some real struggles with its fun, uh, finance at the moment, but also then working with the local health board, education and some charities in that area, so Abelau are a key part of it. And we've set up a project called Love Letham, Letham, a place in Kinross, really high areas of multiple deprivation. And the local authority and associated partners have said to us, how can we play our part to build a wellbeing economy? And the answer through a report we wrote about children's wellbeing budgeting was actually how do we shift the power towards children and communities and younger people so that we're co-producing a basket of measures that better reflect collective well-being, especially for those children, and we can then budget with the local authority, with the health board and others, <coughs> according to that. So we're just setting up the phase two of that project. The first well-being priority they want to address is uh, frightening and disordered behaviour. That's quite a special project, and I say this coming from the independent care review which produced the promise, which did participation in a really high quality, colourful, participatory way because we've done the same on this project. And children are saying to us, yes, there are people on the street who are making us feel frightened because of the way they're acting. Some might be drunk, some might be acting in a certain way, but we understand there are underlying issues to why that's happening. And there's a really, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I think it's a, a symptom of the quality of participation in this project, that children do have that real understanding of the deeper issues at hand and the want to address those, because what's being presented is a symptom of um, inequality, for example, in this case. So that's one example. Uh, we've supported organisations like Jaw Brew, who are a, a small brewery who now kind of embody circular economy principles. They use bread from their local bakery that's old in order to brew lots of their beer. It's an incredible example. I'm a really big fan of that. There are lots of examples from the micro to local authority to others. I would love to get in with bigger businesses. I'd love to get in with those in the finance space and pensions, but how much can you do in a week? There's just a week left before you, week. You, you leave. Yeah. <laughs> it's that mystery job. Um, Douglas, just to, to move us a bit more towards the, an issue that Esther Robertson was, was raising there about what are the implications of all of this for, for policy, for government and so on. Um, if you imagine, the well-being economy uh, by, say, 2030, 2035. Um, and in your case, your particular interest in social enterprise, moving from that, I should have figured out the, 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 the percentage of the economy, but it's well below 5% of the total economy, to, as you're imagining, almost all of it, what, um, how different would it look do you think if we manage to get get by 2030 to 35 to a really significant shift in the way the economy operates? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I suppose to just without um, going back too far and just and defending myself, um, I, w I think it's important to say that I'm not. You know, some businesses are lovely and some are terrible. Some social enterprises are lovely and some are terrible. So it's not a quality. It wasn't a quality thing. It was about the institutional purpose. What's the purpose of that entity? So I think if you've, so some, you know, I was thinking of a butcher in a rural area, for example, you know, private business, single guy, worked there all his life, run the, everybody loves it. That's where people gather, there's some social impact there. It's so, it, you know, that's a wonderful business, really good wee, wee business. So I think if there's going to be a move, um, certainly in terms of social enterprise growing, the challenge really for government, I think, is, that, is, is about the, how we understand subsidy. Because the majority of social enterprises tend to be working in areas where the market is not operational because it's rural, it's in areas of deprivation. So people won't open a cafe or a shop or a cinema in that place because it's not commercially viable. So quite often social enterprises will develop a business there. And that means it's a really, really hard business to run because the market conditions are really, really challenging. Um, and I think there's a bit, it seems, it seems to me there's a bit of a, Two different things in terms of that, the government understanding how it subsidises the economy. I think don't do any more strategy. We're, we've got lovely strategies, I love them, but I think that's enough. Um, but I, I think they're there, I think it's brilliant that they're done. I'm certainly not against them. I'm very, very much in favour of them. We, we need strategy, but now it's time to go, right, how do we actually ec economically change that business? So there's a kind of, I suppose, just um, there's a feeling that in, if you look at the third sector, 
in social enterprises. And I hear this every single day of my life, and I use this phrase myself, about grant dependence. So you go out to a group and you say, look, you're a bit grant dependent. Let's see if we can make you a bit more sustainable. Um, and that's really negative. Um, so it's actually, and actually, in fact, vast stages of the economy, and you'll, Emma will correct me again, because I'm not an economist, but it appears to me that vast swathes of the economy are dependent on subsidy. The energy industry, you know, nuclear energy can't operate, farming, fisheries, they would collapse without subsidy. So, but we call it subsidy because we think those bits of the economy are really important, so we have to subsidise them. But actually, these bits of the economy are not so important. So I'll fi finalise maybe with one example. Um, rural social enterprise, working with people in a business, running a business, um, employing people with learning disabilities that I visited a couple of weeks ago, probably will close, probably, um, because they can't make that business work because the people that they employ need a lot of support. Um, and therefore, it needs increased staffing to support those people. And those people with learning disabilities are being trained and supported and sent out to get jobs in the economy. So they are training those people up and then they're going into hospitality and various other industries and working and paying tax and they're part of the economy. But because at the, at the, the beginning point, there's not enough subsidy going into that, that business will probably close um, imminently. So there's something around, because it's viewed as being grant dependent and therefore negative. In fact, if the government looked and says, we'll give that industry the same subsidy that we give to farming in the nuclear industry, because of all those people going into the economy and then paying tax and not being on benefits, it, has a, it would have a massive impact. So it's just a different understanding of where you put that subsidy to make the economy work better. And this kind of leads on to community wealth building and. Um, personally, and maybe others here, puzzled as to exactly what it means. But one of the aspects of, of, of subsidy there is the use of the government procurement budget mm. to keep things more local. Um, tell us a bit about that, and particularly the issue of, uh, and Emma referred to this earlier from the economist's point of view, there are trade-offs in almost every decision you make when you've got scarce resources, that to procure more locally, you may get less efficiency and less of a particular service. But nevertheless, you keep the money within that local community. I, mean, I think part of that, I think that, who would disagree with that? And I think if you're in a local community or a local authority area, and the, the university and the local authority and the NHS are all spending locally rather than to global companies or national companies based offshore, then of course that makes a huge difference. And the issue I think we're going to have here is, um, having um, gone on a visit down to Wynnum, we spoke, we went on a visit a few years ago with colleagues to, to Preston who have helped to develop this. Um, and the chief executive was saying, brilliant, great idea, we put it all out, but of course they've got meals on wheels, school dinners, a million toilet rolls, you know, that kind of procurement. And they said, we put that out locally and there was nobody there to do it because the local economy was and didn't have the capacity to develop that. So again, if we're going to change the economy around that community wealth building, which could be incredibly powerful, um, fundamentally different, we have to spend the next few years building the capacity of those local communities. And that's not social enterprise, it's local, not social enterprise. So that's small private businesses, local businesses, small traders, sole traders, social enterprises, co-ops, but there's a period of time that somebody somewhere has to invest in those local areas to build the capacity. So by the time community wealth building legislation is through and there's a legislative directive to invest locally, then there's capacity on the ground to take those opportunities up. And that could be a game changer. To return to where, what I was asking earlier, that, that by 2030, 35, let's say, um, how the economy might look different if what you're saying were, were brought uh, into being where you know, the policies flowed through from all the strategy that we've got, how differently things might be. Do you recognise any trade-offs that, that there are that, you know, by, by sourcing your catering for schools and hospitals from a global company, you're going to be able, probably, mm -hmm. to do so more efficiently yeah. than you would going to a local company if you have the capacity locally to provide that kind of service? Yeah, it will be cheaper, of course. Yeah, so that's the trade-off. It's like the example I was using. It's, it's uh, to to trade with that social enterprise that I was talking about is expensive because they employ people with learning disabilities. So to make that commercially viable, which would be ridiculous, your cup of coffee would be twenty pounds. 
So you need to choose, make these choices. So I mean, that's a very common issue for social enterprises getting by, is to make their, their product commercially viable. You know, gardening's a good example. They can't compete with landscape gardeners because if they take on people with disabilities and support needs, they can't win in procurement. So I suppose what we would need to see is that, that embedding those well-being economy principles into things like procurement, not just procurement, then forces that to happen. So you would say, well, actually, we need within this procurement, 25% of the workforce has to be people with protected characteristics or something. I don't know how you would articulate it. But that means that social enterprises are going to go, cool, done. Um, and private businesses are going to go, oh, that's a bit of a nightmare, but we need to do that to win that tender. And that brings those, that, that social impact together. And, uh, and it will make things more expensive. People will need to realise there's more, that will cost more. So there is a downside, yes, of course, but we're pushing that benefit down the, down the river that Jimmy was talking about, or up the river. Jimmy, do you, do you want to talk a bit more about community wealth building? Because there's legislation coming on this, I understand. What would you be looking for that's on that area in particular is going to make a difference? Much of what Douglas has described, I um, agree heavily with that. You, you talk a lot about things that are kind of reasons to you use the word force. I'm also interested in the carrots alongside the sticks and the kind of incentives. So not just, you know, when I was the, in a previous role, I headed up the diabetes and endocrinology unit of a hospital. So I was buying insulin pumps for all of our patients across NHS Lothian. And I could have purchased from somewhere local but we had an offer of quite a, you know, for us, a cost saving for somewhere down in England. And we made that decision because my mindset was, how are we going to save money? So it's about shifting mindsets, but also providing some carrots and support. As well as that, I think we talk a lot about kind of the rules and the regulations. We also need to see some communities of practice and people coming together and saying, here are some, I suppose this is what we try to do at We All, provide proof of concept, examples of where it's happening, inspirational folk who can support others and build that domino effect of this is absolutely possible. So alongside some of those rules and regs, lots of carrots. And also the role of imagination. You were talking earlier about going into, to, to talk to young people about the services that they get. Quite often these discussions are, are constrained by people's inability to think outside the tram lines that, that, they're, that they're in. How do you get to inspire people to imagine a different future for the economy? Mm, good question. You have to... I, I look back to a similar role where, when I was one of the co-chairs at the Care Review, we asked young people, adults, children, with care experience and we said to them what does a brilliant care system look like to you what does gold standard look like so asking open questions i think is the transferable thing that i would say around the economy and that's what we've done in love Letham. ask open questions about what does a good life mean for you what does gold standard Letham mean for you and then ask the appreciative inquiry questions that follow up from that so i think what i'm saying is you need to ask open questions you need to provide spaces that feel safe where there is real, real weight attached to what people share. It's not just a kind of helicopter in extract and disappear opportunity. And you need to make sure that the people doing it have the right skills in participation. And that's why people powered is my favorite P, one of the most essential parts of a wellbeing economy. It's building that capacity for people to ask good questions and feed that in back. I'm doing this like it's a feedback loop into decision making that happens. Do please put your hand up if you want to make particular points uh, or ask uh, questions and uh, I shall scan the room and uh, come, come back to you. But before that, uh, Emma, I, I just want to feed back in a loop, as it were, to um, the discussion we were having about what, what business does. And, and, and there are positives that business brings to this. I, I, on this panel, it's not the, the necessarily the... the, the uh, um, main thrust of what you're arguing and, and, and promoting. But one of the things that business can do um, is imagine a different future by deploying technology. And actually, if we look back to even the time that this parliament has, has existed, and it's heading for its quarter century now, the economy has changed utterly because of technology. Uh, digital economy and online economy. Think of how many sectors have been utterly changed, businesses driven out of business 
continues with you know, Will Cove collapsing. It's, that's all a result of changes in the way that we shop, for instance. Um, is there something that, that, that the, the well-being economy, that wealth building and so on, can embrace from business about how to innovate and how to embrace technology that actually business does very effectively for good and ill? Mm. It's a very good question because there is so much that can go wrong as well as that can go better. Um, yeah, failure is something that business is sort of built into business mm. that, that things can, can go wrong. Yeah. yeah, well, as you was meaning wider than that in terms of actually what that translates to in terms of, you know, the workforce, for example, um, or the kind of, um, you know, unintended consequences, um, which I think we're all quite mindful of at the moment due to the, you know, emerging new AI tools that are that are become available and that feeling that, yeah, things are going to change again. And it's keeping up with that <laughs> is, is difficult. Um, so, yeah, so businesses, I think, will all, always embrace new, new ideas. And it's that test bed in a way, that real world test bed to see what actually works and what doesn't. We talk a lot about that in, in trying to understand policy, what works. You, you actually see in real time. Um, although there are, you know, companies will hang on for, for longer than, than necessarily they're sustainable for, you know, um, so it's it, sometimes you have these lags. I think Wilco probably, their business model probably has been failing for, for some time. But yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question about how you, um, you kind of take what's, what's good and what's working and kind of work to promote that and to to figure out better ways of making it working. Um, so we're actually involved in some work look on, on the social care sector at the moment, looking at innovation in that, in that um, sphere, in terms of the, the great um, things that could be done in terms of freeing up social workers and social carers' time by doing some of those, using innovation, remote monitoring, all of those kinds of things. But there's no straightforward answer there. There's so many pros and cons. It's not there can be a default assumption that innovation is the right way forward, um, but without taking that step back and actually looking at those unintended consequences. I mean, someone kind of said, you know, an innovation would be having, a, you know, an Uber style model for social carers. And you, you're like, well, that would be an innovation. <laughs> but is that actually what we want? Um, so you do. Yeah, we have to keep up with these things. Um, but we, we shouldn't be just assuming that innovation is always, and particularly technological innovation, is always the right way forward. Douglas, do you think that the, there's, there's a risk for the social enterprise sector that they're, they see their role in general? I know it's a very diverse sector, but they see their role as uh, retreating from the, 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 the drive of technology to create more and more efficiency, that it's being social is focused on people, and therefore technology is seen as a threat rather than something of offering opportunities? Uh, no. Um, I, I mean, I think it's quite, I mean, it's, I think this has been partly driven by COVID, but I mean, I would say, and um, we've set up a, within the organisation I work for, we've set up a division that delivers um, digital support. I, uh, because particularly through COVID, the demand to us as a support agency, so I'm speaking as community enterprise now, not as social enterprise Scotland, but as a support agency to social enterprises, um, the demand for digital support went absolutely through the roof. Um, so that and has, and has been consistent since then. And that's new. That's in the last three years, I would say. So people are very, very interested in how do we make our social enterprises more efficient by doing community online training rather than expecting people to come from all over the country to open. You know, can, do we, can we develop our e-commerce? Can we um, digitise our CRM system to make things more efficient? It's, it's huge. So, I mean, I, people are very much embracing it. I think the issue that, and the problem is with potentially where private sector is able to support is that there is no resource for that. So someone suddenly does that thing, brilliant idea, we design it out and they go, right, I need 30,000 pounds to do that. Where does that come from? If you're on your own business, you might take a loan, you might, you might get some investment um, and to invest in the business. But as a social enterprise that's asset locked, to find that investment can be quite hard. So to make the change can be challenging because of the business model, ironically, but there's certainly a lot of interest in it. 
Now, there was a hand at the back there. Um, can we get a microphone to you? Do please uh, put your hand up. The, the way things these, these things work is that hands start to go up the final five minutes of the, the meeting. <laughs> so you, you have more than five minutes now. Now is the time to put your hand up. First of all, yes. Yeah, thank you uh, for the interesting discussion. Um, my name is Dr. Wendy Wu. Um, I come from Edinburgh Napier University. Um, I'm funder for Impact Investment uh, Symposium. Um, I can for have a passion and uh, research in this area for long years. Um, just want to pick up the technology side. You know, our observation to work with social enterprise is uh, come from a few perspective. Because uh, I, I think Douglas said due to the resources constraint, and the social enterprise actually had a lot of good practice. You know, being engage with technology. The challenge actually come from how to scale up. I think in terms of how to scale up, probably it's a matter I work with higher education because researchers has a lot of IP sitting on the shelf and which can apply to the you know society, to the community as a solution. And then probably we engage with the impact oriented investors and to risk you know, invest on this area so we can kind of prototype the solution in the marketplace. So that's one thing related to technology. Another thing I want to pop, um, pick up is on social enterprise side, and it's also about Douglas' comment as well. I mean, from our um, observation, you know, and also from our way working with the social enterprise in Scotland as well, I mean, we just felt the social enterprise as a sector being discriminated, I mean, compared with private sector. Because social enterprise has a lot of good practices, and the social enterprise also has solution in terms of for ESG. But wealth management guys, you know, I mean, we, we heard from them, you know, they just say the green finance product fine, but they all struggled in terms of dealing with the social side. So that's where we felt from economic perspective. I mean, Emma said, you know, you say we, economics about exchange, but how do you? Do we build up that kind of central mechanism to enable those levels of exchange, but knowledge spin in from that sector to the private sector? So that's my, my observation. Thank you. Well, can I st stick with you? Because obviously you've thought through that. And on the second point you're, you're, you're raising, can you tell us what your feeling is about this discrimination and how it can be countered? I think this discrimination maybe is kind of still hidden being unawakened and on the surface level like government put a lot of policy to you know promote social enterprise but as you know Doug said because social enterprise is grown up from the community grassroots you know so therefore there's power dynamic as well in terms of implementation and this a and the b in terms of um, um, the resource side you know because there are so many good practices happening in Scotland you know actually we lead in this agenda globally as well but it's because of lack of resources and then we would be able to amplify that impact. So that's where I, we felt, I mean, it, it's a great area. We need to pay more attention from political side, also maybe from capacity building as well, because um, the structure is already put it there to become a barrier for, for, for the sector. When we're talking about economy, and then we think about private the business right away, and then we discuss that kind of trade-off. Why do we need trade-off the purpose? If everyone talking about purpose, we have the, the golden diamond in our hand because that's compassion, because we care. So I would say there is a mindset change as well. You know, I mean, structure is society to set up this kind of unwritten so private business come top, right? And then maybe other corporate, you know, and then the higher education, then it down to the community. Because community shouldn't be in that kind of hierarchy line. Her I mean, community should be in the heart, in the heart of everything we do and then why we do what we do. I don't know whether I articulated clearly. Did, did I hear you correctly saying that the, the part of this is when you, when a social enterprise goes to a, a private funder, that the finance is also a part of that discrimination? It, it's part of that discrimination. If I, I shouldn't pick this, I mean, let's just say it boldly, okay, let's pick up SNIP, Scottish National Investment Bank. I mean, why the threshold investment for community is one million? How many businesses in the community can reach that one million threshold? Why, why this one million become the, the scene? I mean, we, we obsess with growth strategy. I mean, what do we mean by growth? Everyone's going to grow old, grow, grow to the point we die. What do we mean by growth, you know? So I would say growth is really aligned with Jimmy's point about we grow the community with safe space. Everyone don't dare to voice themselves, you know, there's no judgment being empowered and we grow through resilience and the growth capacity to deal with changes, uncertainty in the community we're facing the environment and grows respect towards nature, towards each other. 
Can, to return to your first point, and to, to, to ask Jimmy about that, about te technology, uh, as you see it, I had a, a discussion uh, from your other co-panellists here, what, what, what's your response to this question of, of the role of technology in, in uh, the wellbeing economy? I think it, it depends, you know, are, are we, I suppose, again, some of the framing is, is it getting away from us? Are we passive recipients of technology and AI and all this innovation, or do we have the scope to try and shape what direction that takes and for what purpose? And Emma beautifully explained kind of the need for purpose to be at the heart of technology and innovation. I've done some work in previous roles with the Digital Health and Care Institute, and some of the things they're developing to ensure the health of elderly patients, those who are struggling with alcoholism and things like that, absolutely incredible and brilliant. And, and that is one good example of use of technology and artificial intelligence to improve lives. Um, I think what we do have, and, and I'm going to steal this quote from one of my favourite people in, in, this, in Scotland. His name's Jim McCormick. He heads up the Robertson Trust, a big funder. And he said at an event a couple of weeks ago, change has never been faster, but it's never going to be this slow ever again. So we have the opportunity to imagine, hope, and inspire and try and work towards that and align ourselves, including technology and innovation and artificial intelligence, towards serving this or be kind of passive recipients of wherever it takes us and just run with that. Jim McCormick's one of my favourite people in Scotland as, as well. So there's something we've got in common. Uh, I don't, I'm not seeing other hands at the moment, so sorry, am I missing one? Because of bright lights. Yes, you're right in front of a bright light, so that's why I didn't see you. On you go. Thanks very much. Um, I hope it's okay to slightly change tack here. Um, I don't have any skin in this game. I'm not an economist or uh, anything, but I am a taxpayer. Um, and my question is really for the panel. I understand why there's been a focus on business, both private business and social enterprise, because um, as the economy grows and becomes more wealthy, the idea is that it trickles down. But we've already heard from um, the woman who was there um, that the inequality gap has hugely increased in the UK and presumably in Scotland as well. So my question is, what do we do about that? Is taxation the only tool available to us? Um, if so, is our tax system working at the moment and what do we have to do to make it work better? Or are there other things that economists... Actually, I don't think this is a question for economists to answer. I think it's really for politicians. But what would your suggestions be? Emma, um, is it, first of all, is it the case that inequality has has increased. My sense is that awareness of inequality has increased a great deal more than the, the actual figures suggest. Yeah, so when you look at the figures for inequality, so, and there are different ways of measuring it, which I won't go into, but it's, it, um, in terms of historical trends, it shot up during the 80s and 90s um, and stabilised during, well, stabilised, relatively stabilised uh, during the the 2000s and it has been pretty stable um, over the last decade or so if you're just looking at the gap between say the um, it's not the richest one percent and they are they've gone stratospheric but like you know say the top 10 percent um the, the in terms of income at the top versus um at someone at the bottom so so yeah awareness of inequality has has increased certainly but actually the trends um, sometimes tell a different story a lot of that driven actually by public policy in the early 2000s particularly um i think that that idea of trickle down economics actually i think is pretty i i meet few economists who would actually say that 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 is a, a realistic way to consider or you know the trickle is minuscule by the time it gets to the bottom it's not a model that that has seemed to be um you know that the evidence points to actually being um, real. Um, so I think we can all agree on that one. Um, just the, ne the next question was getting at something, we, a word we heard earlier on, pre-distribution as mm -hmm. opposed to redistribution. Is the tax system as a means of redistribution 
uh, the best way of going about addressing inequality or should we be addressing what uh, Jimmy mentioned much earlier on about pre-distribution uh, and how, how would you define that? So taxation is just one route. Um, so I think in terms of thinking about pre-distribution, and that, this actually goes back to one of the terms right at the start you mentioned, that the inclusive growth, um, which I know it's, it's not well understood in terms of what it actually is, but part of it was around that using the proceeds of growth to redistribute. But the flip side of it was ensuring that growth when growth happened or when people um, in terms of who was involved in creating that growth that that the right conditions were in place for them to um, to tackle some of these issues around um, inequality so going back to your example people with learning disabilities that um, they need to be part of the the labor market rather than just relying on say the social care system or um, to or the social security system to give them their stand, a, a minimum standard of living, they need to be part of that model from the beginning. So it's it's ensuring that the right conditions are in place to allow that. So it's um it's probably not the same form of pre-distribution that Jimmy would talk about, but it's that idea that you can't just rely on what comes out of um, the tax system. It has to be embedded in terms of the economic model, and there will be trade-offs in that in terms of potentially lower growth but more sustainable in terms of the long term so i think that more i mean i actually not just because i worked on it when i was in the scottish government but since then it, it actually makes a lot of sense to me that that's that's the way you can frame some of this um, and when you talk to gary gillespie the chief economist at the scottish government he would well he has said um when i've spoken to him about it that the well-being economy is kind of the you know maybe the next step along from that but it's still at the heart of trying to get these systems to kind of work together um yeah do you, do you want to pick up on that because you you introduced us for today at least to, to the word pre-distribution and say a bit more about how you think it could work as opposed to redistribution through the taxation system can i do the politician thing and answer that first and then i'll detour back to you if that's okay first of all really glad you asked the question i think people who aren't economists need to be in spaces like this more often so thank you um, I'm no expert in the history of inequality and how far we've come or not in the last 20 or 30 years, but I do know the 20 richest families in Scotland have the same wealth as the poorest 1.6 million, population of Edinburgh, Glasgow and the Highland combined. The World Inequality Report 2022 told us the richest 10% took more than half of all new income and 76% of all wealth that was generated, whereas the bottom 50% captured just percent so not only do we have an economy where wealth is uh, unequal it's certainly growingly unequal when you look at it from this lens uh, to answer your point about pre-distribution um, there's actually lots that we share in that definition Emma absolutely in terms of you know the, the getting the economy to do more of the heavy lifting is how we describe it and there are elements of tax that are essential to that I've spoken about the other P's as well these need to work together but really understanding what might be seen as less progressive taxation, VAT. If you earn 10 times more than we meet, we still pay the same amount of VAT on a chocolate bar. And is that fair? Um, the fact that we've not really explored the potential for windfall tax on unfairly earned incomes, these things should really be thought about. Um, that we could, you know, I would, I know we're more scarce resourced than we have been 10, 15 years ago. It was almost the first thing I was told as I started my career in the NHS, hard times are coming. But the pie is definitely not equally shared. And what can we do to make sure that through taxation that pie is more equally shared? Is it acceptable, whether we've come a long way or not in the last 20, 30 years, is it acceptable that one in four children in Scotland live in poverty and that might be worse because that figure is from pre-pandemic levels so you know are these things acceptable and that's not even considering the the planetary element of of how our economy operates we are short of time to discuss the big quite big question that actually esther who's still with us uh, asked earlier on and this is about applying what we've been talking about to uh what now needs to happen the, the, we've got lots of strategy uh, but sort of tactical approach to, to how you can use the powers uh, constrained by democratic politics, of course, but the ability to persuade people that this is going to be uh, a, 
these are going to be good changes uh, that they will vote for. What can we do uh, with the powers of this parliament? What would have to be done at Westminster? And how much is constrained by a reality of being in a very open economy where we can have all of these things, but if, if, if what we'd say is we're going to ditch GDP growth as a target, it changes our role relative to the rest of, of the world economy that we operate within. Douglas, I'm going to ask you just to, to begin to sum up, really, what, what do we need to do to achieve the kind of things that you would like to see in the economy? Well, I mean, I think we're ta obviously talking about the, a new kind of economy. And um, I mean, I think we said earlier on, I, I'm certainly not sitting here saying this is anti-GDP. I think one of the first things I said, I want certainly all the, the enterprises we work working with to be generating as much money as humanly possible. Uh, I mean, generating money is good. It's about how it's generated. And, you know, colleagues here talked about the differential between staff. There's the living wage, you know, as Emma said, some organisations we work with can't afford that, but they should be paying living wage. So I suppose it's about what, what economy do we want, and it's how do you generate money, and then what do you do with that money? That's the two fundamental big questions. And what a government can do is look at those two questions and say, well, okay, what, what, we need strategy first. Well, as we've said, that's kind of there. Um, but then we need structures. So what structures could be put in place to make that happen? And they have the power to do that. So things like free bus travel for young people under 21, setting up South of Scotland Enterprise, I think was a good thing to do to create that, that different kind of economy in the South of Scotland. So the government has the power to say, well, what structures would really help? Those kind of things really help. And then it is back to taxation. It's what, what happens with money. And it's a finite pot of money. Um, and I think we have to have a fundamental question about what kind of Scotland do we want? And therefore, how are we going to use those finite resources? And we can't dual the A9 and pay for this and sort social care and pay everybody the living wage because the money just runs out. So there's hard questions to be asked. And um, I mean, a government needs to t listen to people and then make those decisions about strategy, structure and money. But your case would be to say, if, if it comes down to it, <coughs> spend a bit less on your roads budget because you want to see a very different structure of subsidies to be able to support... Social enterprise? Yeah, I think there's, 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 yeah, absolutely. We need mechanisms in there. I, mean, I think there are con some constraints around social enterprise. You know, my colleague here talked about the um, investment being a real problem uh, and, and some support. Somebody's mentioned growth. Now, there's some support agencies in Scotland that will say, well, we will support you, but only if you're going to increase your turnover by 400%. Well, most social enterprises say, well, I don't want to do that. I have no, I have no aspiration to do that. So um, there's something around tapping into those, those structures that needs to be changed. Priorities. Emma, what, what, and, and, and on, on the ground, what's achievable if you are in the business of writing manifestos or advising ministers still? Yeah, so I can't let an opportunity go by without talking about my favourite topic, which is council tax. <laughs> so that is like, that encapsulates so many of the things and the challenges we've, we've talked about today. Um, so council tax in desperate need of reform Everyone agrees, but it's it's not happening. And what everyone except the people who'd have to change it. Well, as, yeah. as I was coming, well, yeah. no, the people, and the reason why the politicians don't want to change it is because they don't think it will be acceptable to the people that are be, going to be asked to pay more. So then, so but so where is that? We need almost like a movement of the people who's who are going to have to pay more to be like, no, actually that's fine, <laughs> you know that. And there's a lot of people that would be in that boat, myself included, I think. But still, there's this fear that because the public won't accept it, and therefore the politicians won't go near it. So it's not a case of, um, you know, if it being businesses that are, are being the kind of a, a slow in demand. Businesses want a better functioning property market as well, and then property taxation is how you do that. And they feel the same way about business rates. Yes, they o want Also a based business. on an old economy and of, yeah. of, of bricks and mortar. Yeah, but why is that not happening? And, and that comes down to, a, to this parliament being able to make those hard decisions, but it doesn't feel able to because it doesn't think the population is behind it. So how do you, how do you fix that? This may be your last word. Is there anything else you, you want to add about uh, in terms of what the government uh, would need to prioritise? Well, I think it is about consistency. And pr that is my key, um, my key thought in terms of going forward. And council tax comes into that. But also, rather than just saying that this is what we believe in, this is what we are doing, actually putting those 
policies in place that actually make them happen, even if they are unpopular. And I think that goes, there goes down to so many different areas we've talked about. If they want a well-being economy, then they just have to get on and, and do it and stop um, sort of stop with the hot air in terms of, of saying they will and then not doing anything about it. Jimmy, last word to you. What, what, in terms of priorities and what's achievable and step by step getting to where the vision is? Well, again, before I do that, I'm doing this the other way around. I should have done the pitch right at the start for what we all Scotland is and what we do. Um, and I will be brief. An organisation looking, and the, the phrase we all comes from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, but the purpose is to bring us together to advocate for change. So advice for people in the room or watching, what you can do is join us as a member. You'd be very welcome as an individual or as an organisation. We are really keen to work together to be that collective voice to influence government, to make sure you can feed into the various and many consultations on the various things that are underway uh, for the Scottish Government right now. And our new director is Aileen MacLeod, formerly of uh, Scottish Cabinet, former, uh, formerly uh, member of European Parliament, and she's stepping in on a six month basis. So a real upgrade, she's incredible. Um, but what are some tangible steps then to be different from what we've already heard and because the chair of my board is here who's head of open government at scottish government i think we could double down in our efforts to center as wendy said communities so i would love to see more work done around citizens assemblies and meaningful participation which forms the mandate of the people so that politicians know it's almost flipping it you guys are the mandate we're the mandate and politicians know that in order to be voted in they need to adhere to these principles and get behind an economy that works for people and planet. Uh, the other thing would be to do what Wales have done, which is set up a future generations commissioner and make sure that every decision we make, we have a lens on the unborn and our younger children and the planet as well as us right now. Because as we've heard on this panel, that is too often an afterthought. Thank you very much. There's so much more to discuss about this and maybe you want to continue that uh, discussion. The Parliament's for everybody uh, here. Thank you very much for coming along. S somebody made the point that you don't have skin in the game. As a taxpayer, as a voter, we all have skin in the game. You don't have to be an economist uh, uh, to, to do that. I'd like to, to thank economists and non-economists on this, this panel. Uh, Emma Congreve and Jimmy Paul and Douglas uh, Westwater for a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much indeed for your, your contributions there. Uh, I'd also like to, to thank our partners, the, the Cross Party Group on Social Enterprise and the Scottish Parliament's Futures Forum uh, as well for their considerable assistance in putting all this together and all the audiovisual people who've been doing the work uh, as well. Uh, and a reminder that the, uh, the Festival of Politics is not over yet. There's a, uh, a discussion of Scotland's poverty problem, uh, which starts at 1.30. And uh, where are the ethics in artificial intelligence uh, still to come? So uh, there's a lot of attractions on in Edinburgh uh, at this time of year. But uh, thank you to the organisers for putting this one on and uh, a very fine programme of events uh, as well. So do stick around if you'd like to attend these. Otherwise, have a very good Friday. Thank you.